Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out from your busy shoot. I know. Oh, I love talking about myself, so that's not <laughs> fishy. <laughs> Typical actor. <laughs> um, I'd like to get started off just uh, talking basically about how you got started as, as an actor. Um, and my first question is, how did you qualify for your SAG card? Right. Oh, I don't know, actually. I, don't, do, I must have one, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, I, did, I feel like I've become an actor by default, really. I've been trying all my life to do other things, and this just keeps pursuing me. I give it up after every job. So I don't really know how I became an actor. I, someone threatened or dared me to audition for, the, um, for, for NIDA, where I trained, and I got in. And I was quite amazed. So, and I thought I'd give it five years because there's a lot of great actors out there who don't work. And I thought mm -hmm. I can't bear the rejection. And then I just sort of kept working. So <laughs> here I am. And what were some of the other things you try, you've tried to do to get out of uh, acting? Well, I studied fine arts and um, mm -hmm. economics. And then I traveled for a year and then came back and ditched that and decided to study architecture and <laughs> ditched that and went to drama school. So it's. I still don't know. I still might study architecture. I'm quite fond of it. <laughs> well, you immediately after graduating uh, uh, did a lot of theater. Yeah. Obviously, and garnered yeah. some some awards and, and great acclaim immediately. And uh, I think your career uh, is a relatively short one at this point. But I thought uh, if you quit today, you could say you've had a successful career. An enjoyable career, I've mm -hmm. had. But um, I mean, the school I went to was a, a theatre training institution, right. so I never really thought about making a film. I mean, it's it's a big thing within the industry that they say that the the drama school should uh, have more film components because that's primarily where people get their work in film and television or earn their money, I suppose. But then, I mean, that's a bit of a furphy too. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, but yeah, I, so I just I've always loved the theatre, and that's. That, I mean, it's that sort of intimate connection that you, you're in the room with people and you see them sweat and, and, and go through And they see you sweat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I, I mean, as an audience member, that's the sort of the medium that I've always been drawn to. So it's only really in the last, I guess, four years that I've been working in four or five years in film. Mm -hmm. And you joined the, uh, the Sydney Theatre Company uh, pretty quickly out of school. And, and yeah, it doesn't... Um, uh, a director, Neil Armfield, has a, a theatre not much bigger than this, actually, uh, which has a loose ensemble of actors, Jeffrey Rush, uh, mm -hmm. Hugo Weaving, um, Richard Roxburgh. I don't know if any of you have seen, been to Sydney and seen the stuff, but they, uh, Sydney Theatre Company is, is actors for hire, really. So I was, I did Top Girls there, I think was my first job, and then I was in a production of Oleana uh, opposite With Jeffrey Rush. With Jeffrey Rush. Rush. Mm -hmm. Now that's not a light-hearted play. No, it was, but it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, the argument David Mamet play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the uh, searing polemic of the play it was really, it, it really, I just, it was the, one of the most powerful productions I've ever been involved with. It just, it sort of hit the audience at the right time when all that PC stuff was, was going down and it was really timely. Mm -hmm. So it was great to be in. Is it difficult in a play like that where uh, the two characters, whew, by the end of the play, uh, they look or seem like they're going to kill each other? Mm. Is it difficult? Uh, after after the curtain comes down, um, to look that other actor in the eye and say, wasn't that great? Oh, I love Jeffrey. I, uh -huh. I'm, and playing opposite him, I mean, I thought I'd, I'd hit the heights while I had, and, and a lot of because I've I've respect him so entirely, um, you know, in Australia, and I don't think he's done anything uh, in America on the stage, but he's really, I mean, one of probably our leading man mm -hmm. um, in the theatre. But no, it was it was it's very cathartic when you have those those moments on stage. You you just throw all that shit at the audience, and they're the ones who have to deal with it. You've gone through it during the night, so no, it's kind of easy to go home. It's it's when it's so you not can leave working. it on the stage or leave it at the theater. And, yeah, and it doesn't yeah. affect your your life beyond that. Yeah, I think when when there are problems on stage or when you haven't rehearsed thoroughly enough or there's problems in the script, it's it's then that you take that stuff home because, you know, you haven't had a pure catharsis, I guess. There's You're no still trying to work it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is theatre something that you want to continue to do? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, for me, I, I don't see it's an either or situation. I think both, uh, both mediums feed into one another. I think the intimacy um, 
and the proximity of your audience in uh, cinema is really useful in when you're working in a, a thousand seat theatre that you still maintain that truth that if someone stood up as close to you that, that what was going on in your eyes um, would be as intense as on the screen. And also the, the physical nature of theatre, your, the command that one needs to have one's voice and one's body uh, is um, really helpful when creating a character on film because there's wide shots, there's long shots, there's, um, you know, there's not everything happens up here. So it means that, you know, you know, you've got different alternatives of how to use your hands, how to use your feet, how to, you know, so it's, I, I find them, they, they definitely feed into one another. So you said earlier that the, perhaps there wasn't enough uh, film work in theater schools. Not for me, um, but I, there, I mean. Because there, there is a translation there. There's, the theater is different from film um, because in film you're, you're like this and, mm. and you're not projecting to the backseat of a large auditorium. Was that a difficult transition for you? I was really fortunate. One of the, in my first year out, I did a, uh, a very flawed but very noble um, t television, that way everyone says, <laughs> that <don't> work, um, <laughs> television series uh, that had primarily Aboriginal actors in it and I was basically the only white person in it. And it was shot on video and the scripts weren't very good. The ideas were great. But I got up every day for four months, maybe five months, and got up in front of the camera. And so mm -hmm. I felt that that's where I, I learnt a lot, simply by the doing. I'd hate to see it now, and I think it was aired again <laughs> not that long ago. Fortunately, I was out of the country, but um, yeah. <laughs> so. It, but it's it's the doing of it, I think, for me, because mm -hmm. it's it is a highly technical medium. Of course, theatre is as well. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to understand space. You have to, you know, um, understand text for starters. I mean, film is rarely um, so concerned with the words. But definitely, um, I, st I still don't, there's so much I have technically to learn in film. So that's the challenge for me. How so? What is the, what is the most difficult thing for, for an actor to learn uh, doing I think film? It's from, well, it varies from actor to actor, but for me, it's um, to allow yourself to be seen, really. I think um, I have to pretend that, that no one is ever, and, they, and sometimes they don't, but no one's ever going to see it. Uh, because it's it's quite it's quite confronting, I think, when you know you think you're going to be thirty feet high, and and there's going to be you're not involved in the performance of it on a on a daily basis around the world. It's it's so you, it's out of your control, and I find that very strange. But it's it is you're you're with a group of people, often as many as this, in a in a room, and you have to sort of act as if none of them are there where there's something about the fourth wall and the, the completion that the audience gives a play that you acknowledge their presence. And I think it's, you have to, I have, you have, for me, I had to change my sense, of, my sense of audience, I think, when working in film. Because in theatre, you're always aware that the audience is there and, and but film. But it's part of the experience is acknowledging their presence. Mm -hmm. And I think in film, it's, it's um, the, the crew is not acknowledged except in the credits. They're, they don't exist because that's not part of the, the reality. Unless, of course, the film is very self-reflexive and makes use of that. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, you hear all these guys talking about lenses and I always have to ask, how, how big am I? You know, I just, <laughs> I'm not very technical, you know. So. Well, that's right to the point. What, uh, give us a sense of what attracts you to this industry. Obviously, it's, something has kept you doing this for the last I 10 I or 15 years. I wish I could question. I do not know. I don't <laughs> know. Um, I, I, find it, I find it difficult, uh, the whole... I mean, I love my work, and I'm, I'm intensely curious about people, I suppose. So it's, it's the human aspect of the job that, that attracts me. Um, I'm curious about what... The, the humanness in the character you're portraying? You're curious about the character? Yeah, and also I think about the whole nature of performance, about what um, I suppose I'm on a journey to find out why I do it. I, I don't know. It's, it's really strange. And I, um, I was talking to my husband about this the other day because someone said, what's your process? And I said, I have no idea. I said, I don't have one. And Andrew said, yes, you do. So I, I think he probably, wherever you are, darling, I'm somewhere, um, he observes what I do. But I, it's so unconscious, I think, the way... The bulk of an actor's job happens unconsciously, and mm -hmm. the best advice I, 
I, I, I got from an acting teacher was um, when I was having problems with the script, she said, don't think about it all weekend, just go and do something else. Go to a club, go and dance, just don't, you know, let your subconscious deal with it. So it's, um, I, I guess my subconscious has a reason why I'm doing it, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know, I really don't know. There's many relationships on a set and in a theater during uh, rehearsals of a play. Um, you have the director, you have the other actors, you have the technical people. Um, there's a, always a huge creative team. How important is your relationship with the team in general? Or do you focus on the director or your fellow actors? Um, uh, well, the first couple of films I did, I think it's so, the sphere of focus, because it's like learning to drive a car, you know, it's like getting in a car and not having any idea where the brakes are or the gears. You're sort of, you're very, not so concentrated on the road. And I think the more you do, the more you can take people in. And also I come from a, um, a filmmaking practice in Australia where everyone just mucks in and does it. It's not as hierarchical, mm -hmm. I think, as it is perhaps in America where everything's quite demarcated and that's quite foreign to me. So it's sort of, I end up doing you things in America. You feel yourself wanting to move the chair? And, yeah, and, and people say, you're so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but it's just, I, I don't know, it just is very, I'm simply one cog in it. And without all those other people, it wouldn't even, you know, it wouldn't even be captured. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I mean, for example, this film, The Missing, that we're, we're doing at the moment, the crew's fantastic and I... I really do think that that comes from the director down, the atmosphere that's created on set. And Ron is so uh, respectful of what everyone brings and interested in, in actors. And I'm, I'm sure that comes from being an actor himself and understanding mm -hmm. that sometimes it's hard, you know. And um, so it's, it, those relationships are really important to me. And also they're, they're your audience on the day. They're the people you're performing for. Yeah. Is there any one person on the set who is your your greatest ally, somebody who's going to make your job easy or wonderful or whatever it is that day? Well, uh, ultimately, it's the other actors mm -hmm. um, because you, one has to trick oneself almost like in a, in a childlike way that the that the crew isn't there when you when you come down to it. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, the make hair and makeup trailer is always a place where people gravitate, mm -hmm. and um, it's a very intimate relationship one has with a makeup artist and that's really it's for me it's always the that and wardrobe is where one begins to open the dress up box and start to visualize and create a character so they're often the, the people that that I sort of talk to about silly ideas that I want to try out and you know visually and um but I mean the director relationship is 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 vital mm -hmm. and it's also the cinematographer they've got to make you look good so. I'm sure <laughs> Very important person. Tell us about The Missing. What is, what is the story? What is it about? It's essentially, it's a Western. Uh, it's, a, it's a redemptive story. It's a father-daughter relationship. Tommy Lee plays my father, and I'm someone who's had a very uh, damaged life. He exited the family when I was very, when my character was very young, and he returns, and... Um, Everything goes wrong. I have two, there's sort of a hint at abuse and I had a child out of a, an abusive sort of connection and so I've got two young daughters and one of them goes missing is by this band of renegades who are selling girls across the border in Mexico and so I have no alternative but to enlist his help to find them and so it's really... Um, Akiva, who did a pass on the script, Akiva Goldsman, who um, described it as being one long scene be between the father and daughter that, that, um, mm. uh, that's divided up with a lot of cowboys and Indians. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you get to ride much? In the, I in do, the and I'm loving it. The cowboys, the wranglers, have just been... I mean, you're asking who was um, the, the ally on the set. And for me on this one, it's been the horse wranglers. It's been those guys that I've been, who've been teaching me to ride and the stunt coordinator, Walter Scott. It's riding out with those guys that, that I got a flavor of what it's like to work on the land. So 
they've been absolutely, you know, they're the people I sort of look over and, mm -hmm. and they'll go like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully more of that. But, yeah. So are you riding side saddle with a long skirt like you did in Elizabeth? <laughs> no, no, I'd, I'd side saddle. I'd, that was thrown at me from a weird angle. I didn't know I had to do that on that film. But no, I'm not, I fortunately haven't had a bad experience with a horse. Mm -hmm. So no, I'm astride the horse in a corset. Which is a bit difficult, oh. but um, <laughs> I throw it off three quarters of the way through. Keeps the your form straight, though. Yeah, right, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Charlotte Gray, one of your um, earliest lines in, in the film was uh, uh, that you say to uh, this young pilot that's going to be leaving. Um, you ask him, "Do you believe in fate?" Do you? Yeah, I do. I, I'm very incredibly. Can you hear me? <laughs> incredibly, incredibly fatalistic about work. Um, I think for me, anyway, the things that I think, uh, oh, you, you, I don't like to muddy projects with putting my hands all over them. I mean, for example, The Missing, I just happened to be in New York. I was there for two days publicizing a film and my agent called and said, Ron's in town and wants to meet you. And I said, sure. And I'd never met him before and he had this Western he was doing. And it was just, I happened to be in town. And that's how this all came about. And I love that. I love not, well, I'm, no, I'm lying. I'd love to know what's coming next. It's, it's very unsettling not knowing what your year's going to be. But as I'm sure most of you are, know. Um, but I don't like to, I, I never covet roles. I don't say, you know, I, I must play Lady Macbeth. Because it completely depends on who else is involved with the production, where it's going to be, what the, what the concept is. It's not, you know, I, I don't like to think of anything as, don't like, I don't like life to be too constructive. I like the chance of it all. You know, I, I do like the strolling player aspect of it, even though I like to be able to know that my mortgage is going to be paid. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, you know, it's a balance, but yeah, I'm very fatalistic. How much of this career that, that you've had to this point has been planned? None of it. Uh, as, I say, as I say, literally, I think, oh, God, I'm never going to work again. I'm, uh, I don't know if I want to work again. I sort of feel like the, my relationship to my work is it's a, it has to be an illicit love affair. It's, it's got to woo you back every time. And um, say, for example, The Lord of the Rings is uh, I was making a film in Savannah and um, they said, would you come for three weeks and do this? And everyone was saying, oh, you can't book yourself up for three weeks. And... It's, you know, it's, there's other things coming up. And I said, it's Peter Jackson. It's, I'm, I'm an elf. It's fantastic. <laughs> so it's, and that was just a complete random thing. I'd never thought, I, I wasn't a great fan of the books. I mean, you know, they're amazing and wonderful, but I wasn't sort of a, an avid Tolkien reader and thought if, if they ever make, you know, um, The Lord of the Rings, I must play Galadriel. It was, mm -hmm. so I, I went to it, into it knowing virtually nothing so the process of it is not one of having strange expectations um it's you learn about the role you learn about the production and it becomes what it is in that moment and then it's gone i mean it is an ephemeral medium even though hopefully these films and this archive will last for thousands of years <laughs> <laughs> but, you know it's so it's i like that about it mm -hmm. do you have a process or a way that you choose a role or reject a role andrew <laughs> I don't. There you are. <laughs> um, no, I'm really bad at reading scripts. Terrible at reading film scripts. I I find it very difficult to visualize them. Um, so it's often only, uh, almost always, talking with the director that I um, that I have any conception of what. It, what it's going to be and I love a director who's got lots of visual ideas images because it's often images or, or music for me is a, is a way into something into a into a film but it's really um it's a leap of faith because often it's not there on the page um certainly with Elizabeth that was the case I mean we were rewriting that on a daily hourly basis um so if, if I had taken that script at face value uh, I wouldn't have done it. It was it was Shaker and his no, knowing his body of work uh, and juxtaposing that against what could have been a very uh, normal BBC version of events 
which it wasn't. It was chaotic and strange because Shaker did it. So I think in the end it's the conversation with the director that, that makes me choose a film, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Speaking of, of Elizabeth, um, that's a character that goes from a seemingly sheltered, happy life and is thrown into uh, a position where she has to make a decision and she may lose her life and then she becomes this incredibly ruthless and uh, powerful person. And that's, it was a wonderful transition to see that Mm -hmm. uh, watching the film. My question to you is how over the weeks or months of, of shooting this, how do you as an actor track that evolution, especially when it's shot out of sequence? Very carefully, um, I obviously did a lot of research and Shaker, he would say this to you all, he wasn't at all interested in history. And of course, it's one of my great passions. So (laughs) um, we were constantly, in a a healthy way, I mean, he was a dear friend, in in a tussle about that. So I knew that it was my responsibility to kind of in any way, I don't know if it ever came across, but to, for, for my own satisfaction to mark all those historical beats, um, even though the film wasn't particularly concerned with it. Um, but I, I suppose because I, I like to do a lot of work and then throw it all away um, and then just let whatever happens in the moment happen. But I do, I do write down every scene and um, obviously do my text work and beat the script and say... This is going to happen. I want. I want to try and achieve these little things in that scene, and and try not to do the same thing in every scene. I mean, I, I do mark it through, um, and then just refer to those notes the beginning of the day before you you shoot, and then um, but then forget it because no one wants mm-hmm. to watch someone's homework on screen. It's not what what people go to see. You know, you, I don't. You don't want to see all the cogs turning. You want to feel that you're transported by something. So um, in the end. I suppose that's the um, the command of one's technique is to be incredibly technical, but then to be incredibly instinctual on top of that and let, yeah, give over control in a strange way. What is it that uh, that you would like an audience to leave the theater with? Uh, some sort of cathartic experience or uh, just a, a look through a small window in this character's life? What is it, I mean, in your... In your, in your heart, what do you want them to leave the theatre with, whether it's the uh, live theatre or film? It depends from, uh, for, from project to project, but uh, I had an acting teacher who talked about very strongly about the collective unconscious, and I do think that that's, there's a strange thing that happens in the theatre when it's working, where some sort of circle is completed, and that you've constructed something between you, um, the players and the audience. And I don't, I don't like to go as an audience member, uh, I don't like to go to the cinema and feel that someone's public persona uh, is reducing the, um, the power of the piece. I don't want to feel like I'm getting to know them as a person, as a celebrity. I, feel, I like to feel that that as an actor you're able to create an other reality that somehow keys in, even if you were talking about the, the Queen of England, Elizabeth I, that people might think about Margaret Thatcher or um, what it means to be a woman in the 50s or that you're somehow tapping into other things and other time frames that are beyond the so-called obvious reality of a film. Um, I mean, you want, you want it to affect people in the way that they affect it, that affects them and... You know, and some people are going to hate it and some people are going to like it and maybe two people in Idaho will get it and no one in New York City will get it at all and, <laughs> and you can't control that. Is that what you want to leave the theatre with as an audience member also? I want to feel like it's done just for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's great when, you know, when you've gone to see a film and you've all had completely different readings of the film. I think that's a great film. Um, and I think it's really healthy when people hate it and people love it. Because it's obviously stirred something in, um, and um, often quite different emotions in people. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't like to tell an audience what to think. So, um, and certainly don't want to play into an audience's sympathy where they necessarily have to like the character. Um, 
because he, I suppose something I do try to do is to show a character, no matter how small they are in a film, in a, in a complete way, um, warts and all way. Uh, so it's that, that classic thing of not trying to judge the character or judge the film. And also, I mean, it's different in the theatre because if it's well rehearsed, you do have a sense of what it is, particularly through the, the, the previews. But it's hard to say what a film is, particularly when you're making it, because it's such a piecemeal job. Uh, and the editing is, is another thing entirely, which the rhythm of a film changes. And I mean, hopefully, if, a, if scenes are well written and well performed, you can tell what the rhythm will be, but you won't know what the rhythm of the film is. It's impossible to say. You said that you rely oftentimes on directors to um, visualize the film for you. Do you when, you, when you go into a shoot, do you go through any kind of a negotiation process with the director? This is how I see the character. How do you see the character? Is there a, a give and take there that you, uh, that you go through with the director before you start shooting? Absolutely. On a, on a daily basis. Um, I, yeah, obviously have very, not often very easily, uh, it's hard to articulate uh, who your character is and it's often only in conversation that that sort of comes out. But definitely, I mean, that's your responsibility. That's why you're hired for your, for your opinion, for your, your take on things. And so I'm not particularly interested in working with people who aren't interested in, you know, working with me, I mm -hmm. suppose. Yeah, but for, sh for sure, I mean, that's the pleasure of it. It's that continual, I mean, Kislowski said filmmaking is a conversation and it absolutely is every day. That's why you do it. It's sort of, and if it's a one-way conversation, it's really boring. <laughs> so. <laughs> Aha, that's why you do it. Maybe it is. conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. to talk. Do you have a physical routine, routine that you go through to, to stay ready for the roles that you're playing? Is there something you do in between projects? Uh, sleep. To keep your, sleep? <laughs> <laughs> to keep yourself uh, in tune? Oh, you mean when I'm not working? When you're not working or when you're working? Uh, well, strangely enough, when I was doing Oleana, I had a, um, did a lot of yoga-based voice work. Uh, you know, that you've got to root your voice in your body and... And so therefore, if you're connected to yourself physically, then you'll be connect more connected to your voice. So I would have this long sort of half hour to hour warm up that I would do every night. And Jeffrey would just come in, have a shot of whiskey, <laughs> go on stage. I'm like, how did he do that? <laughs> but I think as you, as you get more in command of one's instrument, <laughs> not that I drink <laughs> before I go on stage, although sometimes I do. It depends how stressful it is. Um, I think that... It gets, your, your, your muscles are much more, um, simply by working, you're exercising your muscles. But I've, you know, I find that you know, in terms of a physical regime, I, I would tend to be more active when I'm not working, simply because you're so sleep deprived. And also we've got a little baby, so you know, we, I don't think I've had slept in longer than about 5.30 or 6 for quite a long time. Well, happy Mother's Day, by, yes, by the way. Yes, thank you, thanks. <laughs> So you do, you're more active uh, in between projects and, and the reason I ask is for actors, young actors that, uh, uh, that need to be ready. Uh, they need to be ready for the audition or uh, the, the upcoming project. Maybe, maybe they've been cast uh, and there's certain things that, that need to be done on a regular basis when you're not working I think to keep so, you ready. Yeah, I think specifically if you've been cast in something then the job will dictate the physical demands of that. And that was what was so great for me, um, having three years to train, is that you get up every morning and the, the best acting classes I had were the movement classes where you would, you would think about every single aspect of your body. And um, I don't know if any of you have dealt with Laban, but the whole um, physicalization of text is, was for me incredibly useful. And I found that there was a gap when I left drama school, um, not going straight into work, that all that energy that one has when one trains, you, you need to sort of use it up. Um, and I've never really been a gym bunny. So I would go and do, um, I really responded to a lot of um, Asian dan dance techniques. So I would go and do Suzuki classes. And I found that that stomping was really great for me. Um, you know, so I'd, I was, I suppose I do dance classes because I just found that whole integration where you're not thinking. 
And the thing about auditions is you can never be ready for them. <laughs> they're, just, they're horrendous. They're absolutely horrendous. I think the more you do, the better you get at it. The more you don't care, the better you get at it, you know. Uh, and the, I mean, the, the best thing that happened to me when I when I left in terms of film, when I left um, drama school, was that a casting director in Sydney was so supportive of me, and she would call me in to read opposite actors. So I was not on screen; there was no pressure on me, and I could simply observe and help other actors have a good audition. And I thought, that's what it is. It's not about me. It's about what you're doing to the other actor, which is very difficult when you've got someone from the casting office saying, I love you, I really love you, and you have to respond to that. Right. It's, you're not getting a lot back. So it's, you know, it's, it, you have to kind of <laughs> stretch yourself a little bit that way, but it's, it's simply by the, by the doing it. And, I mean, there's a lot of, it's terrible when you walk out of an audition and you think, that was dreadful, I could have done this and I could have done that. And mm -hmm. you just have to let it go and say, well, it's just, it's all helpful. It's really helpful to audition. And then hopefully you get to the point where you don't have to audition anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> Somebody told me in LA that we are not really professional actors, we are professional auditioners. Mm. And, and we do that for many years. Mm. Who are some of the people that uh, you feel have influenced you as an actor? As an actor? Or that you admire? Um, Definitely, uh, there's a lot of stage actors in Australia that um, he wouldn't know. Um, but definitely Jeffrey, for sure. And um, Jane Fonda, I really admire her. She's a cat with nine lives. I think she's extraordinary. Um, uh, but definitely her work is amazing. Um, and Liv Ullman. And I think probably for me, it's the Swedes. I, I think that Ingmar Bergman is a, a genius. And my husband was in um, up up there last year, and was speaking to some of his actors and um, talking about the way I've never met him, but um, the way he directs and that it's very gestural based. And he would give an actor um, they, were, they were doing a Schiller play, I think um, Mary Tudor, that one of them, but, um, Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth, that conversation they have, and he would give the actors uh, a series of gestures, which for some actors was really frustrating, and that the process of the rehearsal was that over the eight weeks, however long they had, those gestures would connect up and you'd have a physical understanding of the, the you know, of the, um, of the character. So he, he wouldn't tell you where to stand or any of that stuff. He'd just say that, you know, if you scratch your head on this line and then I want you to pick up this glass on this other line and it would be, you'd, some of them would feel like robots, but that over that time, that, that, that you know, it would synthesise. So I think that I was really inspired by hearing that. But it's strange, it's really strange when you admire someone um, I don't really want to meet them. I, I'd rather just sort of see their work. It's a bit... Um, someone was talking about this meeting between Woody Allen and Ingmar Bergman and that they had long admired one another and they got together to have dinner and they didn't speak for the entire night. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else spoke and I can completely understand that. They and didn't they, want to be disappointed? No, they, they both were <laughs> so awed by one another's genius mm -hmm. that they just didn't know what to say. And it's, it's often... It's, it's when you work with someone... I think that that's the best thing because then you're sort of on equal grounds and you have something to talk about. It's like going on a blind date. It's really strange. But um, definitely the Swedes, Liv Ullman, I think the, the two films, um, Faithless and Sophie, the films of hers I've seen are wonderful. <laughs> Back to young actors. Um, how does a, an actor create their best possible chance for getting hired when they're, aus when they're auditioning? I think the best thing is to not take it personally. Being, being a reader um, and being on the other side, the way actors are spoken about is often disgusting um, and it's often completely like talking about a box of cornflakes. It's just not the right colour. And that often you think you'll sit in the, the, the waiting room thinking, why are all of us up for the same role? And often it's because they just don't know. And so you're either right for it or not and... There's not a lot you can do about it. I think the best thing is <laughs> to not be nervous. How do you do that? <laughs> I don't know right. how, you, um, how you do that. I think that it's... I, I probably got my first job by walking in and being so pissed off. <laughs> I just didn't want it. 
I thought, I have no interest in doing this. It's a Sunday. I don't really want to be here. And I was just, and so I was really relaxed. Um, I think it's, it's, it is like going on a date. The more you try and sleep with someone, the less they want to sleep with you. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you know, don't be sleazy. <laughs> so playing hard to get is good. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. In a sense. But it's also, it's, um, it's I think 99% of an actor's job is listening. And it's, it's what the other actor does. And if you're lucky enough to be in a room with another actor, and particularly one who's maybe already been cast in the role, they have a vested interest in wanting to make what you're doing good so that, you know, the best person is, is hired. But it's listening. It's not thinking about yourself. And it's, I mean, it's, you know, it sounds like an oxymoron for, for an actor, but it's, and particularly with the media, you know, the media focus on actors and what actors do and what actors say. I mean, just shut up, really. <laughs> just get on and do it. It's, 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 you've got to think about other people. You've got to watch other people. You've got to observe other people. It's a human endeavour. It's about, it's about people. It's, you know, um, so when you say, why do I do it? I, don't, I have no idea <laughs> because I, I'm always sort of trying to look out, not look in, you know. And I think that really helps. Um, Focus on something outside yourself. Mm -hmm. And so any, you know, in the downtime, what you're saying before, if you, I find if you do, um, it might be aerobics for some people, anything that takes you out of yourself. Because there's a lot of time where you sit around and you think, why am I not working? It's a natural, natural thing, you know. Is actor training um, really relevant to actor performance? I mean, is there... Is there something in the schools that is essential to an actor's career that, that is not being taught, for instance? Well, Stella Adler says that you can't teach anyone to act. You can only awaken what's inside them. And I, I do think that that's true. Um, uh, from, well, it depends. I mean, every actor is, is different. Although everyone in my year did really respond to these movement classes um, because it's a, it's a physical manifestation of what goes on internally. And I think that we're quite out of touch with our bodies, even though we're so body focused as a, you know, in, in Western culture, it's, um, we're pretty out of touch with them. They sort of, we find them our enemies. Um, but I, I definitely think that for me anyway, the, the whole concept of trying to get yourself to understand what are the, problems is the wrong word, but what are your physical tics, what are your physical mannerisms, to be aware of them so that you can as, uh, well, as much as possible to neutralise them so that you can take on board another character so you're not always bringing your own problems, your own day onto stage. You're, you're stripping that away to take something up. So I think it's, it's really hard um, when you feel you're there in an acting institution for three years to get work. Um, often I think they're increasingly less and less process-oriented. It's like all education, really. I mean, you feel, speaking to a teacher today who he said, well, I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, a high school teacher. I'm, I'm simply there to, to get them to pass their grades so they can go to university rather than to learn, you know. Um, and so it's really, I think it's a really good acting teacher who can say, this is happening now in this room. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about yesterday. This is, you know, to try and be in the moment. Mm -hmm. You have a penchant for playing very uh, pivotal roles, uh, very strong women. Uh, for instance, Petal Bear in <laughs> The Shipping News, who in my eyes was just this tornado who whipped through these people's lives, and because of her, everybody around her, their lives changed. Um, are these the kind of roles, I mean, is that something you look for in a role? I mean, it was very, it was small but meaty. I mean, well, the there was reason, a lot there to work with. The reason why I chose, I hadn't read the novel, Obviously, I wanted to work with Lassa, and that was the role that on the page had interested me because I'd read an earlier draft of the script uh, where the character said, nibble, nibble, little mouse, when she was having sex, and I thought that was hilarious. I thought I'd love to play a character who says, nibble, nibble, little mouse. So it wasn't in the, the new draft, and I said, if you put that line back, I'll, I'll, I'll play it. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was crazy. <laughs> and I know it's going to not make any sense to anyone but me, but what I did... <laughs> to prepare for that role was watch the Teletubbies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't explain. I can't explain. 
Spain. <laughs> I just watch the Teletubbies. So I don't know. It's very strange the way I pick roles. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I just sort of hadn't played anyone like her. And I think often what happens, um, and certainly I felt this after Elizabeth, is there's a, a pressure, an expectation that you're off and racing and this is what you want and this is where you want to head. And as soon as anyone says that to me, I'm off in the other direction. And I have always done what interests me and I have, I have no interest in, in paving a career that, that walks that line, you know, it's, it doesn't interest me at all. So I hadn't played anyone like her. And often when you, you play smaller roles like that, you're f much freer to experiment. There's no, no one is watching because they're all watching Kevin Spacey because it's his movie. So, <laughs> you know, and so you just, you know, I, it was like making a short film. I was in there for a week and I thought, well, I, the only thing I said to Lasse was, if it's too big, tell me. And he said, I will. I mean, he didn't, wasn't Indian, he's Swedish. <laughs> 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 yeah, whenever I do an accent, Andrew always says it sounds Welsh or Indian. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Well, you have done a variety of accents I have, in movies. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's a long process to try and not them not sound like they're from Delhi. But you know. <laughs> does a director's approach on on the set or even before uh, production begins uh, does it affect what you do as an actor? Um, their method. I know every director is going to be different, and their methodology mm -hmm. on the set is going to be different. Do you let that affect you or are you able to stay in your own space and, and work the way that you want to work no matter who's behind that camera? Uh, once again, I had an acting teacher in third year who said, um, you're going to come across a lot of people, she said this to all people in that year, who are difficult, who are not interested in, I mean, there are some actors who are not interested in other actors. It's all about their performance and that's the way they work. And why shouldn't they work that way? Why should I force everyone to work in a way that satisfies me? So she said that you've just got to find a way to use what seems to be negative positively. It's like getting into an argument with someone. You just think, well, I can either get really angry here or I can not. And so oftentimes, you know, film sets are often very noisy. So you have to find a way. Um, Michael Chekhov talks about spheres of focus. And as an acting exercise, what you do is you you concentrate on the immediate sounds in the room, the sounds outside the room, and the sounds within your body, and the sounds within the immediate sphere. And so you have, you know, you've got focusing techniques, I suppose, and I think about that. But um, uh, so I, I, I don't like to prescribe to other people a way of working. Or I'm not someone who likes to say, look, what I need from you is this. If you can, can you say it that way? Can you, you know, and often actors do that. And so you have to find a way of, translating that to sort of, and I, I don't mind, I don't go in there with a set thing thinking I have to stay in this chair and on this line I'm going to pick this up. I might think that at home, but then if an actor does something different, then that all changes and I might end up doing the scene with my back to the wall looking at that picture. I mean, it's, and that's what's great. So it's, it's um, you do your work, you, you plan it and you think, I hope the director encourages me or gives me this or that, and if they don't, they don't. And, but you're still going to work. That's part of that negotiation process that you were talking about earlier with the director. Do you are you able yeah. to walk in and say, "This is how I prefer to work"? Uh, no, because I don't really know the way mm -hmm. what I prefer to work. And often my ideas are not necessarily the best ideas. I'm ho you, you, the only reason why you do your homework is in case no one no one else has any ideas on the day. You're hoping to <laughs> God that someone has better <laughs> ideas than you do. You yeah. know, it's, um, so. I mean, you know, I, I will obviously, if if they, if the director wants to, to say there was a scene in Elizabeth where he, would, and it was a council of war scene and, and he wanted me to sit on the throne. And I said, no, that's really silly. I said, by this point I should be at the table, I should be with these men talking about it because she felt very strongly about war, so why would she be, she wasn't someone to shy away from things. So in that particular instance I said, I have to sit at the table. I, put my foot down and shook my hair. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, but I mean, there are things and, and often that, that will then affect the way, what, how, you know, how everyone else does it. It's a, it is a negotiation, but it's a conversation. And mm -hmm. 
often a hated one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ascribe to a particular uh, acting technique? Um, Stanislavski, Meisner, uh, a bit of Chekhov, everything, I think. A bit of everything. And mm -hmm. the reason why one has techniques is to, when things aren't working, when things are flowing, when everything's going well, you don't have to think about that stuff. But it's, it's like, uh, you know, car crash analogy. But when, you, when you're driving along and you know those moments where you don't know how you got home? You, that's when an acting when it's working well on stage and film that's how it should be but sometimes the car's coming toward you and you need to remember how to drive and so that's what your technique's there for is to sort of to problem solve really and I think if you the more exposure one has to a variety of techniques I think the better off you are because you're thinking about things in different ways you're expanding your acting vocabulary which is really important I think what are you doing uh, just before what are you doing in thinking just before the director says action? Often it's thinking, oh, I hope that person shuts up or moves out of my eye line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm trying always to think about where I am at the beginning, not where I am at the end, so that each take takes on its own arc. Uh, you have to let go of the previous take. Um, but often it's, it's sort of shopping list thoughts um, and trying to empty all that stuff out and just simply think about the very first thing that happens to you in the scene and nothing, you don't know what else is going to happen. So it's quite, often it's quite, um, I was going to say scary, but it's quite exhilarating because you don't, you don't know where you're going. So a series of takes can, can be very different, each one. Absolutely. Uh, and I think the more I've worked, the more I want, and the more you trust the director, the more you want to give them, within the boundaries of the character, as many different options in the editing room as I can. Because the more I've worked, the more I understand that a film is such an organic beast and, you know, you, and because it's done so out of sequence, if a scene... Scene 64, which you're doing later down the track, ends up becoming this, and you've only played this scene two in one way, then, then the flow of the film might be affected. So if you can play it in seven ways, if you get seven takes, um, then it, it allows him more free or, or her more freedom to, to um, put the puzzle together. But, of course, you have to trust them. If you don't trust them, you only do it the two ways that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. So... So there may be a great deal of improvisation um, from take to take. You start it, you know where you're going to start, but you don't know where you're going to end. Oh, I think acting mm -hmm. is improvisation, mm -hmm. um, hopefully with a really good script. But, um, you know, I'm not a great one for, um, for playing around with the lines too much because I do trust writers and I think I do, you know, I go to a dictionary and I look up the word hate because hate has thousands of meanings and you pick the one that, that's, that's relevant for the scene. So I, I do pay a lot of attention to the text. Of course, I'm, you know, if the, if the style of the film is loose, then you, of course you improvise verbally. But I, I mean improvising within the line and that's the challenge. That's the architecture of a scene. And if a scene is really well written, the beats are there and they're there to support you. So it's, um, I think often... That whole thing where directors say, we're just going to improvise around this. It's like trying to play tennis without the rackets. You know, it's, it can often be a bit reductive, I think. Unless, mm. you know, you're with people who are really good at it. Is there a, a particular role that you've played to date that you feel encapsulates what you, how you feel about yourself as an actor? No. <laughs> no, I don't know how mm -hmm. I feel about myself as an actor. I, I'm not being coy. I really don't yeah. don't think about it uh, too much. Um, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the the variety of things that I've been allowed to do, um, and each oftentimes, I mean it's different for everybody. But for me, oftentimes the most enjoyable experiences don't necessarily make the, the best films, or the character doesn't come across the best. Often, the most arduous ones are the ones that people connect with. So. Can you tell when a film's going to be good or successful while you're shooting? No. I have, some people might be able to, but I have no idea. No idea. I remember after I did Elizabeth, I said, I did a film with John Cusack, and I, 
I said, I've just done this film. I've hardly made any films and I, I'm not going to work. I don't have a career. It's just <laughs> a mess. Uh, and he said, look, I said, and they're asking me to do this publicity and I don't know what to say about it. And he said, look, you don't want to be an actor who doesn't do any publicity. Just do a little bit. And, you know, I, I mean, it was because it was, it was such a crazy way of working. And, of course, I didn't have any experience to know that that's, you know, often the way, the way things go. Um, I was sort of used to a theatre rehearsal process where, you know, the function of things is quite ordered and you can, if it's a mess on um, the last preview that it's probably going to be a mess on opening night. So mm -hmm. that was my, my, my only comparison. So you, you leave the set and uh, on the last day and you just don't know what's going to happen or what it's going to look like, basically. I have to forget about it. Mm -hmm. Move on. You know, because you don't want to be taking the positives or negatives, really, with you from that job. It's, um, yeah, you just got to, each job's different and will be different, mm -hmm. hopefully. Then you wait for the phone to ring and... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How do you uh, reconcile the desire to make a great movie or, or perform a, in a great play with the need to pay the mortgage? Uh, look, I'm in a really fortunate position, you know, at, uh, you know, at the moment, but I've never done anything for money. Um, no, that's never been a motiv motivating factor for me. I mean, I... It doesn't seem that long ago that I left drama school and I literally couldn't afford to have a coffee. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, um, I, I think one can get very, we're in such a materialistic time, it's not a very good time for the arts at all. Um, and what is deemed a successful film, as you all know, is on its box office. And they're rarely the films that affect me for more than 25 minutes after leaving the theatre. So it's, it's always been the project and I fortunately have a really great agent in L.A. Um, who says, she said to me about something that was going to pay me a lot of money a couple of months ago, which I'd probably be kicking myself for not doing, but she said, you've got to live with it. That's going to be out there on the video shelves and you're going to rent a video and go, oh, my God, I did that. And that's the, that you, you have to sort of say, I don't know. I mean, if you're in financial distress or you had a lot of dependents and you could justify doing those things, then do it by all means. Um, and also, there's plenty of other actors out there who'd probably do it better. I think if you do things for cynical reasons, the outcome is cynical. So maybe there's a, an actress out there who completely connects with that character and doesn't see the script in the way that I see it and who should do it. Sure. So you do have to be generous like that and not panic, you know. I think that oftentimes people think, this is my moment, this is my chance to sort of secure myself and life's just not like that, I don't think. Well, I'm going to go to uh, questions from the audience, and I'm going to read them off these cards. And when I read your name, uh, raise your hand so we know who we're talking to. This is uh, from Lori Thomas. Lori? Lori with the great purse. Uh, her question is, what pearls of wisdom that uh, teachers and or directors give to you proved helpful in developing your acting process? Uh, well, Keith Bain, who was my movement teacher at drama school, whose life actually was the, um, the, the colonel behind Strictly Ballroom, um, he said that... Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Getting excited. <laughs> um, he, he said to me that... Uh, this is in my very first class, on my very first day. We had to do this exercise where we walked around in a circle in our leotards and the rest of the class were there and they had to observe you and then mimic the way you were walking and exaggerate the way you were walking and to show you all the physical habits that one had. And he said, everything that's pointed out to you today will be with you for the rest of your life and, and it, your journey as an actor is to try and combat those and neutralise those so that you can be a glass of water. Um, and also, I think probably, I probably already said it, this is the other um, acting teacher who just said, don't block out anything an actor <laughs> gives you, positive or negative, just use it um, and listen, I think. Listen, listen, mm -hmm. listen. 
to me. <laughs> now the truth comes out. Uh, Nan, Elsa, sir? Or over there, okay. How is Australian, the Australian approach to training similar or different from uh, British or American? Uh, I think probably, from my understanding, it would be quite similar to American, in that when one approaches Shakespeare, it's with great sort of deferential reverence that really one's voice isn't meant to be doing it. One's accent can't, you know, you can't say, what country <laughs> friends is this? Um, <laughs> Uh, I think it's very, I think comparing English acting, which is all I can do, to Australian acting, is I find theatre in Australia that the actors are really physical. And, um, and then Australian actors who I see in America working in film, there's really a kind of a, oh, fuck it, I'll just give it a go sense. There's no, there's, I don't think we're very cautious, probably because we think... <laughs> Um, we can't believe that we're, we're working because the industry's so <laughs> the industry's so small in Australia. It's really small, and that actors who work in film there, um, oftentimes the films don't get seen overseas. But in terms of training, um, I think most acting institutions in the West draw on the same the same philosophies. Um, but yeah, I think probably there'd be a I've noticed a physical quality to Australian acting, um, yeah, both in film and in theatre. So I don't know that's the same here, though. I don't, I don't know many people who've trained here in, in America. I don't know. There's a big emphasis on physical. I don't know. You have to tell me. I think it depends on the school. Yeah. It varies quite a bit. I think it's mm -hmm. the same, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Terr, over there. How did you prepare uh, yourself for that early scene in heaven where you were so devastated to find out you had killed innocent people and not the person you had intended. It was very effective in wrenching. Thank you. Um, that was one of those films I didn't enjoy making. Um, I found it really unpleasant to have to face. I'll just, if you haven't seen the film, the character I play um, sets out to assassinate uh, the man at head of a drug cartel who has been selling drugs to children in her school and has. Um, sold husbands to her um, drugs to her husband who had overdosed, and she kills the bomb. Gets put in a waste paper basket and ends up going into the lift where two children and um, their their father and a cleaning lady are killed. And this, she finds this out. Um, I filled my trailer with the most horrific images which you can get off the internet which is so disturbing of um bomb blast victims and because i had no idea i, I thought I can't, there's nothing in my life you know my the death of my dog is not going to prepare me for this one so i you know i <laughs> i've used it before but, um, so i yeah i i i just looked at those i i looked at those images every day and i sort of they were so, and, and I was apart from Andrew, which was awful, and so I felt quite isolated and just went back to my ho hotel room in Bottrop, which the most exciting thing to do was to go to the Warner Brothers Fun Park. It was in the industrial part of Germany. Um, and I didn't realise how I'd much I'd accepted those images into my unconscious until uh, the first assistant director was had his little daughter on set, and she he, she knocked on my trailer to say hello, and I opened oh and I shut my trailer straight away because I thought oh I'd forgotten how horrendous it was because I've been living with it for so long, so that way in was completely visual. Sherry, over here, okay. Which role have you played that has been the most challenging? Oh gosh. Um, they're all challenging in their own way because otherwise I wouldn't. I like to be terrified. <laughs> I'm sort of a bit strange like that. I, it's like the first day of school every time you start, you know, take on any role. Um, and I always think I have no idea how to do this, which is terrifying, but it's also exhilarating. Heaven was very difficult. 
uh, also because the, the script was written by um, Christoph Kislowski and his writing partner, Prisivitz, and it was a very early draft so, and badly translated and very enigmatic. And the director, Tom, was quite you know, Teutonic and very... So it was trying to find the balance between those, the poetry and the script and Tom's sensibility, which I found very difficult. And also, Kisowski wasn't there to make sense of these riddles. So I um, often felt quite alone on that one. The challenge is often different. I mean, often it's equally hard to be light. Um, you know, on a, on a day where you've almost had an accident and... You know, you've got PMS, and that's, that's often a challenge. Um, but, um, and I found this particular film, The, the Missing, that I'm doing at the moment, a challenge because I had never been on a horse, really, and I wasn't a great lover of westerns. I knew nothing about the genre. So that presented a challenge in of itself. But I always look for the difficult bits, I think, in, a, in, a, in the world. Did you prepare for the, the missing by watching westerns? I mean, is it a genre that uh, requires a particular style of acting? I think it's always good to know um, the genre that you're working in so that you can subvert it or adhere to it. Um, the more information you have, the better. Also, I, I'm not a great lover of guns, and I have to... Andrew describes this thing with John... What, what's the film? Where, if you hate me talking to you, wouldn't probably. <laughs> 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 where, where John Wayne is is going on a stagecoach on a horse. He's got two carbine carbine mm -hmm. rifles, and he's shooting them off like this. Yeah. What, what's that film? True. True, is it True Grit? Yeah. I thought I'd seen True Grit. It's probably every movie he ever made. Yeah. <laughs> So it's good. It's good to know. It's good to know what the what the range is, and also you know having Tommy Lee, who's who's you know shot a gun in basically every film he's ever made. He's so good at it, and he's a great he's a great horseman. So um, that that helped enormously. Um, I always look over and just say, "Is this right? Am I holding it right?" Okay. So, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely. I I, I I tried to watch a few of them. Uh, Duran. Duran Candelaria. Hi. In playing an American woman in the South in The Gift, how did you manage the dialect? Are you a natural mimic or did you work with a coach? Uh, yeah, there was a, a, a coach on that and she worked with all the actors. Because often, because I, I know I have a lot of work to do because I'm Australian, I think it's often harder for, um, say, an Australian actor to do a regional Australian accent than it is for an American actor to come to Australia to do the accent because they, their ears are perhaps more open, I think. So they work, she worked with everyone. Um, and I, how I found the voice, which always has to be integrated to the body, unless it's, you know, it's a, a farce or a huge comedy where, you know, like say Miro Savino in that Woody Allen film, you know, where it's, it's part of the point. But in the gift, it wasn't. You just didn't want to think about it. I went to see a lot of psychics in Savannah, and there were a couple there that I obviously taped. And so I, um, I like to find someone specific to model it on, um, and then once again to forget about it. You know, and that's that advice where if you're doing an accent, it's 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 very very technical, and um, <coughs> you have to walk away from it for a week or two, and just talk like you speak like you speak um, so that your subconscious can absorb it I think um, but yeah no I, I, I specifically based it on someone probably don't sound anything like her but um, to me I did <laughs> <laughs> Barney Garcia Barney Stoyer He's left. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I'll ask this question. What was the most difficult transition in coming to the United States and performing here well, Barney. Uh, <laughs> um, well, it's strange. I, I mean, we we live in England at the moment, and my father was American, so I always sort of thought I'd end up here. So it sort of, it's um, didn't feel that strange. Um, and my first job in America was actually in Canada, <laughs> but it was an American film set in New York, and. Um, <laughs> Don't tell me it was shot in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and Mike uh, Newell was directing, who's English, and he just said, um, he said, you're a theatre actor starting, you can do an American accent, can't you? And I said, I said, yeah, I think I can, yeah, yeah, I can. 
So that was, that was the most important thing to everyone, that I could do the accent. And once I'd sort of got over that hurdle, it was just like making a film anywhere. It was, I didn't find the transition particularly difficult. I guess it was the biggest transition for me was making the first film, which was in Australia. Because um, at first it's a very different medium. Well, it is a very different medium to theatre. But I, I didn't actually think about it. And the first film I actually shot in America was a film I did probably two years ago now called Bandits. And that was the first mm -hmm. time I'd ever filmed in America. Was it? Oh, no, I lied. The Gift was. The Gift was the first time I filmed there. The Bandits uh, makes me think that you've worked with Billy Bob Thornton several times. I love him. He's great. Pushing Tin and Bandits. And, and he was one of the writers for The Gift, yeah. correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He keeps me in work. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia? I think there's more than one Patricia here. Over here? Okay. Hi. Are actor uh, or actresses discovered anymore? What is your advice to actors who are getting started in the industry? Uh, don't go on a game show. <laughs> 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 um, I think that there's a very, the skill of an actor, I feel very strong about this, is being eroded by the cheapness of uh, a lot of producers who think think anyone can do it. And I think it's eroding our sensibilities. What we're perceiving, um, I was reading Stella, Stella Adler's book on um, Ibsen, and um, because I'm playing Hedda Gabler in Australia next year, and, and she was talking about realism and saying, and I think that our sense of what is real, what is natural, is not. Because an actor's job is always to raise something up, to heighten something, to make it feel like it's the only way it could possibly be done. And I think that um, that I don't. I think yes, people are discovered and people are discarded. I think the challenge for an actor is to have a sense of longevity, and that is your own responsibility, because no one out there, or very few people out there, are actually interested in your development as an actor, and that is what you have to do. What you're saying before about the downtime, about honing yourself physically, psychologically, mentally, culturally. For fuck's sake! For fuck's sake! Um, you know, that, I mean, that's 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 your responsibility. And I think that yes, you might get your foot in the door, but is it a door that you really want to go through? So I think it's the question you have to say is, why am I really? No, oh, this is I don't know. This you asked me this question. I'm telling you to answer a question I can't even answer myself. But <laughs> am I becoming an actor because I really want to be a celebrity? No problem, but just admit that to yourself. Or am I an actor because I'm interested in? in the um, the dissemination and the furtherance of, of culture. Um, and if that's the case, then walk through the door, take the opportunity and run in the opposite direction, I would say. Um, but I do think people are discovered. Um, but increasingly, I think that the mainstream cinema is, I don't feel it's talking to me. I don't feel it's generally talking to me as a, an adult female. I feel like it's sort of aimed at it's talking down to us, really. So um, I suppose if you're given those opportunities, take them. Take what you can from them and try to keep developing, I guess. Tim Costello? Right here. Where? Oh, right there. That's him. In preparation for a film role, how much rehearsal do you prefer? And could you talk about a different director's preferences on rehearsal? For a film role, it was that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll say Barry Levinson, who directed Bandits. Um, no rehearsal whatsoever. We sat round and we listened to music. He wanted me to, my character to be into sort of Motown, and I said, uh uh. <laughs> 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 um, and so I played him some other stuff, and um, eventually I convinced him that Bonnie Tyler was the way to go. But that was the only rehearsal I had with him, was listening to music. Um, and say Gillian Armstrong, who I've d done two films with, she really likes to rehearse as much as she can. And what I've realised the second time working with her, it is primarily for her, that rehearsal. So oftentimes it's not productive to be in a rehearsal like that because it's about blocking and it's so that she can plan her shots, whereas I don't necessarily want to... If you're not going to rehearse deeply... Um, then often the blocking can feel a bit shallow and I feel a bit silly. Um, and it's really important not to feel silly <laughs> in rehearsals. Uh, 
So I had to feel embarrassed. But it varies from director to director. And oftentimes it's, um, it's good not to rehearse some things because often take to take is your rehearsal. And you just hope they use the good bits. <laughs> so. <laughs> Zach Montoya, right here. Hi. When did you decide to become an actress? Oh, yesterday. <laughs> um, I decided when um, I was offered a place in this drama school that I'd take it and uh, that I'd give it a go. And I think it was probably my third year. Uh, I played uh, Rosalind in As You Like It and Shakespeare's As You Like It and Electra. Uh, and I think it was the experience of working with really good directors and also that uh, that Electra was, people, uh, I think because it was so difficult an experience for me, I, was, I sort of forgot that the audience would have a reaction to it. And so people were quite affected by it. And I think it's that thing when you can make someone laugh or you can, you can make someone very emotional, it's a very powerful thing. And it's a, it's a, that's what keeps drawing you back. It's trying to, to affect an audience. So when that first happened to me, the first time in my second year, I was doing a comedy, a Willie Russell comedy, Stags and Hens. Um, when people laughed, it was fantastic. You thought, <laughs> I've told a funny joke. <laughs> <laughs> they like me. <laughs> um, so that, it was that. I think it's, it's, it's like having a really good conversation with someone. So I think that was, it was probably at drama school, mm -hmm. I think. Anthony Trujillo? Right here. Over here. Have um, you or any actors um, ever used hypnosis to memorize a script. <laughs> if not, how do you go about memorizing lines? Yeah, I guess I'll have to as I, as I age. <laughs> Gracefully. Um, uh, no, it's, it's always been... I think if you know why you're saying what you're saying, it's the easiest thing in the world to learn them. Because it's, it's often the subtext. It's what, it's what you don't say. It's the pauses between the lines. Often what we say is a mask completely for what we're feeling or thinking um, or even for what we want. You know, this whole classic thing of wanting to get someone to sleep with you is you don't, <laughs> often asking them outright doesn't work. So uh, it's, yeah, it's always knowing why you're saying what you're saying, what you, what you want from the other person, what, what you, you know, that whole classic action objective thing, you know, um, so. Nathan? Right over there. What is the hardest part or what was the hardest part working on a trilogy like The Lord of the Rings? And happy early birthday. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, the hardest part, I had no, I mean, I'd long been a fan of Peter Jackson's work. I think he's an absolute genius and really no one else on the planet could have done those three films simultaneously. And, you know, all hail to him. So I really wanted to work with him. So that bit was easy. Um, the hard bit was, uh, I mean, it's really that, that I didn't know how to play an elf. And so I didn't know what, I know I'm being serious. I didn't know, I didn't know what, this, what the style was, what the tone was. I, you know, and you see these people in these funny wigs and these little funny feet and you think, oh, it's a comedy. Okay, it's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you, you get on set with Peter and it really is just like you're doing Chekhov. <coughs> you know, he says, this is the one ring. And, the, and, and you completely believe. every. It's like he's, he's saying, you know, your, your mother's dying in the, in the bed and it's the last moment you'll speak to her. And it's, it's, it, the scene has as much um, naturalistic import uh, as, a, as a naturalistic scene like that. So he made it really easy. But it was a bit strange to play opposite uh, a small person in, in an animatronic mask while, and I have to be really tall as an elf, I had these 70s disco boots on <laughs> that were sort of made in the same uh, material as my shoes to raise me up. So I was sort of on these kind of stilt things and it was a bit hard to suspend disbelief. <laughs> but, you know, if it had been another director other than Peter. Uh, and I, so I found the challenge of, uh, of, of blue and green screen Really interesting, all the technical stuff not being particularly technical. So. Did they tell you kept the ears? I did keep the ears, yeah. <laughs> they, they were quite sick, the people in Weta. They made me, because they were just tips that they put, because my ears are quite large. Anyway, <laughs> uh, they, they made me tips and they put them in a box of chocolates 
and <laughs> gave me all the tips at the end. Because, of course... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Ingalls? Right back here. Okay. Given that celebrity worship is so out of control, do you, think act <laughs> do you think actors should take more conscious steps to help temper it? Uh, you know what? It's got nothing to do with actors. It's got to do with the media. It's got to do with what they think you want. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure, like me, you're sick of reading about it. Um, but really, if you don't buy those magazines, uh, I don't know what those people are doing, unless you bump into them. I don't think that there's much you can do. I'm not one who does a lot of interviews, but you do one interview and they're syndicated. So suddenly, the, or you do one photo shoot and someone buys the photos and they put cobble together various things that you've said over the last six years and make an interview out of it as if you've given one. And so you've got no control over it whatsoever. And also, I suppose it's, it's very easy to, um, to ignore white noise. You know, it's, it's just, um, it's like tourists in Venice, if you've been to Venice. It's like they all walk the same way. And everyone talks about don't go to Venice in August, but all you need to do is step off a side street and it's not, not there. And I do think there's a big difference between an actor and a celebrity. And a lot of people construct their, they do, their, their, their image and their, their career through the media and all hail to them. I mean, there's plenty of people there who are willing to publish that stuff and if that's what their interest is, it's, I sort of see it as being a different profession, really. If it can be, being a celebrity can be called a profession. I don't, you know. <laughs> but I, I really don't know there's much you can do. I think the media is quite out of control. Well, is there a way not to buy into it as an actor? I mean, it's obvious that uh, I think a celebrity, like you say, is different. They choose certain roles for particular reasons, and generally they play themselves or that particular role over and over and over. And, and but look, I mean, they it's, buy it's, into it's that a different media skill. machine. I would find mm -hmm. it very difficult to play myself. So it's a, it is a skill, and it's not a skill to be scoffed at. You know, it's just a different thing. Um, and I suppose it's, yeah. It, uh, I, I think the distressing thing is that um, it's what younger actors, I suppose, are, are told to aspire to, that it's, it's deemed as being successful. But you have to have a very strong yardstick and just keep a sense of what it is that you respect, what it is that you're after as an actor or, or an audience member. Um, you know, there's, I mean, there's... 450 films made a year, Ron was saying last night. I mean, it's America's second biggest export in the entertainment industry after arms. So it, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> out there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it is, it's annoying. Elizabeth? Right here. What is your favorite movie? Oh, oh God. My favorite movie. I'm... I don't know, it changes from, from day to day. It, no, it really does. Um, I really like, uh, well, I love the Decalogue. Kislowski's The Decalogue. Uh, and I watched that when I was at drama school, along with um, Fanny and Alexander, which I just think is a masterpiece. Um, and I think that, uh, what was it? I was talking about the other day. Oh, it's all the Swedes. Um, Liv Ullman made a film probably about two, years, two, three years ago now called Faithless, which was so raw. Um, I thought that was uh, amazing. And there was an Australian film made, gosh, maybe four years, five years ago. I went to the Berlin Film Festival. I don't know if you probably haven't seen it. It's called The Boys, um, about this terrible rape and murder of a, a nurse. And, but it didn't deal with that at all. It dealt with the, the, the day in the life of these boys who committed the the heinous act. So that was an incredible film. I thought it was a very mature uh, Australian film. But, you know, ask me tomorrow and they're the ones that spring to mind. So those are the kinds of movies that move you? Yes, that I suppose that have, have changed the way I look at the world. The Decalogue absolutely did. I mean, I can't, I can't think about life in the same way after seeing those things and I think they're the you know sometimes you go to you go to the cinema to to be entertained to switch off and that has that function and that's fine you know like you don't 
if you're going to see a Bergman film, you're going for different reasons than if you're going to see an Austin Powers movie. And they're just different aims. So, um. mm -hmm. Michelle Shook, back here. What draws you so strongly to the strong and transcending female film roles you take? <laughs> Strong. Oh, gosh, are they that strong? Um, <coughs> what draws me to them? It really, it's not the character, I, um, I'm i afraid. It's the, it's what the director says about the story. I'm interested in the whole thing. It's once again not wanting to think about myself too much, probably because I'm terrified and thinking that I'm never going to find a way to do it. So it's, um, it's always the story. Um, <laughs> But they have to, sometimes it's a line, like with Petal, it's a, it's a crazy line. I think what type of person would say that? Um, but it's usually the, the situation of a character. Is it an interesting situation? Is it a situation that, that I have anything to offer, really? Um, and I think it's really important for actors to say, you know, if you're lucky enough to be in that position, to say, I shouldn't do this one because I've maybe done that before or done something like it before and... Someone else will have something more interesting to say about that than I will. Um, but I don't know. It's, um, it's always, is this conversation with this director and this script going to be an interesting one? Because you can't guarantee that anyone's going to see it. Of course you want them to, but you can't guarantee that. So it's not for cynical reasons. It's not like, this is going to be a hit. <laughs> this is going to make my career. <laughs> <laughs> so. Dennis Garber? Oh, way over here. Good, my agent's here. Am I doing good? Hi. <laughs> what is the best and worst about filming in New Mexico? <laughs> the worst is the dust. <laughs> we were filming up at the gypsum mines. Oh. And um, my, um, my little 17-month-old son came up and got a sty because of all the dust. The dust and Ron is so classic. He, he's a type of, he's got boundless energy. And so he, um, you'd say, look, it's a bit, it's a bit dangerous, Ron, what we're doing is, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, the dust has been pretty major, but as I said, you use it, you use it. <laughs> and the, the best has been, um, the crew is a really mixed crew. There's a lot of, uh, people from New Mexico and um, Dan Lee, for example, and, um, and people from other parts of America. So it's, and the crew is fantastic. It's a really great atmosphere on set. But it's also, it's the landscape. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I love the desert, even though everyone thinks about Australia as being beach, 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 beach. It's sort of 70 or 80% desert. So the desert's what I'm always drawn to. There's something about it that makes you reflect about things in a completely different way to, to looking at the ocean, which I think is really... Um, and we're staying in Santa Fe and we just, just think it's extraordinary. So um, it's, yeah, it's been the people, but also I feel so privileged waking up every morning thinking, wow, I get to look at this. I get to ride my horse through this. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty and good. shoot that gun. Yeah, mm -hmm. shoot that gun. Yeah. <laughs> William? Way over here. Okay. Hi. Who was your first acting teacher and what's your earliest acting memory? Um, well, I was writing and putting on plays in primary school. Try and shut me up. <laughs> I was one of those annoying kids. Can't, can't we do a play? I want to do maths. Um, so that was really early. And I, um, but I always wanted to swear. In, so that was, a, <laughs> it was I, probably my earliest memory was being told, I, you know, that there's other ways to shock people other than swearing. Um, but my, I think I would have to say that my, my first real acting teacher was Keith Bain, who was the movement teacher at NIDA. And also I worked with um, uh, an extraordinary woman called Lindy Davies who had a very particular technique um, where you, you physicalise everything. You fill the space with junk, basically. And you find a, a physical connection to a line by ripping a piece of paper or by... So it's a very visceral connection to text. So that was very influential. And also um, with a, a writer, director, actor called Nick Enright, who has uh, passed away, unfortunately. 
and he was very much about the generosity that one needs to have as an actor. So I would say those three people that I worked with at drama school. But you're constantly learning. I mean, you know, like I hadn't read um, this particular book by Stella Adler, you know, and it's really great to sort of, to always be like a student. Of course, accept that you've, you've learnt and you're a professional. It's not to sort of denigrate what you've learnt through your, you know, through experience, but that you, you keep that curiosity alive that one has as a, as a student. And that humility, basically, I think. Lydia? Right here. Hello. I think this, she meant to say, how do you feel? It says, who do you feel? How do you feel when you have some, have to do a nude scene or a love scene? What nude scene? <laughs> <laughs> if um, you ever had to do. Yeah. Um, I've been asked to do it, and it's really interesting watching a director when I say, why do I need to take my clothes off? Watching them go, well, um, uh, and there's no reason. And if there's no reason, then why should I do it? So um, if, well, what's the point? I mean, it's this, there's enough people willing to do gratuitous nudity and gratuitous violence. Let them do it. I don't like watching it. Um, but if it was necessary, yeah, I, I would. If it was absolutely intrinsically necessary for the scene, then I would, but it hasn't been to date. Um, and fortunately, I haven't done any love scenes with anyone who's been sleazy, so it's quite... <laughs> it's, been, it's been quite funny. And, you know, it's embarrassing, but it's also... You're doing it as a character. It's not to sort of... You know, it's... Um... So if you treat it like a scene then it's much, much easier to do. But I, I do think that, that the, the experience of acting, um, the, it, it is a stripping away. And so there are moments um, when I feel much more naked and vulnerable than doing a love scene because of the, the things that you need to expose and the things that you need to, um, the places one needs to go as an actor. So that's often, you know, you have to be very intimate with the camera on all levels, I think. Deborah Martinez, right here. It was a pleasure working with you on the first, seventh scene in The Missing. I played Maria. I saw that yesterday. People were squirming. We had to pull a tooth out of a woman's mouth. Ouch. Uh, her question is, <laughs> how do you cope with uh, the grueling film schedule and balance that with your family life? Uh, well, like I said before, having a baby, I, we do get up very early. Um, and Andrew is a writer and he writes best in the morning so we're sort of always morning people but it's having an incredibly supportive partner darling I think um, and we always go together and um, it's an absolute priority because it's not um, I mean some people are sort of saying my work is my life but it's not for me it's a part of my life and if I don't have a life then I've got nothing to offer the uh, you know my work so yeah, it's a priority. Joanne, way back there. Hello. How difficult is it for you to let go of a character after you've done shooting a film? Um, it's pretty easy. The, the horrendous part is when it comes out and you've got to talk about it. And I don't know why I do things. And, and so you've got to sort of sit in this room and do interviews countless interviews <laughs> um, and try and think of original interesting things to say about often very unconscious decisions um, and often um, it's awful because you sort of you want you do want to talk about the film I don't particularly want to talk about myself or my favorite designer you know whatever <laughs> stupid thing they ask you, you know. um, so I mean that's the, that's the bit it's then that I become conscious and realise, oh, my God, people are going to see this. That's when I get nervous. And that's when I sort of start reliving it. But an odd thing happens. Um, I realised this when I watched, they showed a few cut scenes the other day, is that I, when I, the first time I see the film, which is I generally only see it once before I do my ADR, um, my post, you know, my dialogue and stuff, um, when I watch the film, I sort of go through the whole thing again. In my, in my head, I sort of, and if you put, to put um, a camera on me while I'm watching, it's sort of like, 
you know, I, I sort of, uh, it's like this weird thing, like I'm sort of inside the scene again. And so I feel like um, that is the final process where you can really let it go. You have to give it over and think, okay, that's done. And it does help if you go into another job because you've got no time to think about it. So. Dave Harris? Is that there? Hi. What do you think of the emerging uh, digital film medium? Ah, I was talking to Ron about this the other day because uh, I was saying that I thought it would be very sad because I think there's a, a rhythm to filmmaking which is often frustrating where you're just ready to think you do the best take ever and they have to reload. Uh, and, and so you have to hold on to it and, and try not to get frustrated to let it go. Um, but I quite like that because oftentimes what you think is your best uh, is not anyway. And it's, I sort of like the rhythm of filmmaking. And Ron was saying how great it would be that you just have to, you wouldn't have to cut. You could just keep shooting. You could shoot for ages. And I sort of like the fact that it's, you see people do things to the camera, that there are people involved. Because I think the more, the, less, the more you take people out of the medium, the more inhuman it becomes. Um, I mean, I know there's several directors around trying to make films where you scan people, scan actors in, and then not even use them, just use their scanned and images and manipulate them. Well, it doesn't really interest me. And I do think it's a bit of a blip because I think at the end people are interested in, um, in people. In, you know, and so it's the human side of the medium. I, th I like the rhythm of it. But, I mean, I think it probably has its benefits in some some ways, like if you're shooting a big action sequence or anything like that, it would be great to not have to... Or in New Mexico, you wouldn't have to worry about checking the gate all the time because there's all the dust in the camera. <laughs> it might be good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm not enamoured with it. It's kind of like the theatre. They would say the theatre's been dying for hundreds of years, but there's always that human quality that I think people need, and, and live theatre will always be here. Will Definitely. Always be there. Yeah. And it's I that think connection. It has... You know, I think it's been perverted and subverted in the way that we're sort of obsessed with the minutiae of um, Britney Spears' underwear. You know, it's sort of that, that you know, that it's that, that's, but it's the same desire. We want to be intimate with people who perform. I mean, it's a, we want them to tell us something about ourselves, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Steve Ridland, right here. Hi. Who has been your favourite film director so far and why? I've worked with. Um, I really loved working with Shaker uh, on Elizabeth. He, get, he just trusted me uh, implicitly. But I also loved Lassa because he laughed at my jokes. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, I've been really fortunate. Uh, I love Tom Tikva who directed Heaven because his, his, uh, his sensibilities were so different to mine. But he was absolutely passionate about it and that infected everyone. And with Ron, Ron is so uh, tireless uh, and such a, a lover of film and he's so respectful of what everyone brings to the set uh, that I, you know, admire him enormously. So there's different qualities in different directors. Um, but it's been... In the, in the theatre, I think, too, it's the, it's because, I think it's because I do love rehearsing. So there's theatre directors in Australia who, you know, I would love to work with again and again and again. Noel Copal, back here. Hi. What is the relationship between all the people and production companies listed in the film's opening credits? <laughs> For example, who are all those people? <laughs> 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 who, a who actually produces the film? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, there's the p people who put the money up and you rarely see them. Uh, and then there's the people who have brought the project to a production company. So, for example, there's a man called Steve Crystal at Imagine, which is um, Ron's film. And he, Ron's always wanted to make a Western. He showed me this 10-minute Western that he made when he was 10. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, you know, his wife, uh, no, he wasn't 10. He was, his brother was 10. He was 17 or something. Um, but... So Steve Crystal said, this is a great Western or potentially a great Western. It needs a rewrite. So he, he, I think he will probably get a producing credit. And then the person that he got the script from, from another production company, who 
will get a producing credit and then there's the people at Imagine who put up the money and then there's a studio that Imagine is affiliated with. So it's just, you know, hierarchical. But you rarely meet all those people. It's um, And then there's the, the line producer who's actually there on a day-to-day -day basis um, and often people who have been involved in a production company for a long time um, as production managers, they will often get associate producing credits. Often that's what actors get. They get executive or associate, associative um, producing credits. Simply by lending their name to something, it means that then people can go and get money and therefore their name has been used and so they've been involved in the raising of finance. So therefore they'll get a, uh, some sort of producing credit. So You won't see my name in the, uh, in the missing <laughs> producing. I'm just gun for hire, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Anne. Hello. Earlier in your career, were there ever any challenges <coughs> significant, significant enough to make you consider a different line of work? Oh, <laughs> God. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I got a lot of great roles at drama school. And, and then I got out and I didn't work. No one sort of knew what to do with me. And I sort of suspected that would be the case because... It's, I don't know whether, what it's like in drama schools in America, but you have this agent's day where you do a piece and um, it's meant to be quintessentially who you are, which how can you know that at 21? Um, and they offer you a place at their agency and you get work. And, of course, every piece I come, come up with, the head of the school said, no, you can't do that. No, that's, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. So I chose my piece, I think, the day before uh, and was so nervous and was so dreadful. Um, the, the thing that was said to me on my audition day was, what the, that's a lovely dress. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought I was in trouble. Um, so I didn't work for six months. And I thought, I really, I thought I'd give myself five years. I'm very impatient. And I thought, uh, you know, I was ready to give it up after six months because the rejection's awful. It's awful. I mean, you know, it's horrendous. So I gave it five years and, and then I, um, I was in Oleana. Uh, and that was really great for me. And then that um, some television producer who saw it and cast me in that series. And then I just did a lot of theatre, really, for about three years and then started making some films. And But, yeah, no, definitely. But I still do consider it. And I think it's the I think it's important as an actor to think that there are other possibilities in life because it's so um, random. And, you know, when you see other people working and you think, I'm not working, you think, well oh, what am I doing wrong? And so you can implode. It's really important to be positive and, and think, well, no, I will go back and study architecture, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so is it important for especially a young actor to think that, that you, need, you should have something else in your life besides acting? I think, I think um, everyone's parents who, you know, when you tell your parents that you want to go to drama school, you want to be an actor, it's like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know, they all do that thing. But, okay, well, just go and study, you know, um, social work just in case. Or, you know, <laughs> I don't know that you can necessarily do that. You have to give it a go. And this, I'm a great believer, and I hope we can impart this to our children, is that it's not one's education doesn't stop at a certain point and that we live in an environment now where doesn't matter whether you're an actor. I mean, that most people change professions two or three times in their life. There's no guarantee that you'll, even if you say, I'm going to study to be a doctor, that, that you're necessarily going to get a great job or can, you're not going to be retrenched from a surgery or have a malpractice suit, you know, um, launched against you. I think that you can't, you can't safeguard yourself entirely in life and certainly choosing to do acting is a risk. But I'm all for risks. I think risks are good. Mm -hmm. Alicia Griego? Yep. Oh, right there. How do you see your role in the community? My role in the community? You mean uh, what the responsibility an actor has to... Is that what you mean? Yes. Uh, I definitely think that uh, there's certain things I wouldn't do. Um, I don't think working in the arts is a moral profession. I don't think that you can... Say, say, for example, there's a big thing um, that happens a lot. If an actor smokes on film, they're saying that, that they're, given a, they're giving a bad example to children. I think that, that that's an indictment on the education system and that the, what a child has at home is that if you're, if you're making a film in the 40s, everyone smoked. 
Like if you're making a film in, in, the 18, in 1895, everyone took snuff. It's what they did. It's like some people in films have alcohol problems. But the, it's, it's, it's part of the fantasy that is filmmaking. So I think that it's really important that, that children are taught, taught to think for themselves and are educated well so that they can know that what they're seeing, if you see Saving Private Ryan, that is not what happened in the Second World War. That is a particular story, you know, that the English were very involved in the Second World War and it wasn't just the Americans, but, you know, you have to, you know... <laughs> that, <laughs> But, it, you know, it's, it's really important that, you, that children are taught a sense of history because that was Spielberg's aim. He was telling, he was telling a certain film and told it absolutely, a certain story and told it absolutely brilliantly. But if, if, we're, if we watch films and we think that that is fact, it's, it's very restrictive as an actor because your role is to take people on a journey somewhere that is um, often a hybrid between fantasy and reality. And I think this whole thing with reality television, you know, that this is real, you know, it's, it's sort of perverting our sense of, of, of what is real and true. But, there, but having said that, there are certain things I wouldn't do. Um, I think I don't want to see a woman portrayed like that. Or I think that that, that that use of smoking or alcohol is absolutely gratuitous and is so I, therefore I wouldn't participate in that. Um, so I think it's really important to have... To have your own sense of, um, yeah, your own moral judgment so that you can defend, I suppose, the choices that you, that you make. Um, and I think my, my role in the community is to, is to entertain, really, at the end of the day. I mean, it's what Moliere's players did. They pulled up a wagon and they entertained people and, um, and to offer people... Uh, a slice of life in you know for an hour and a half in the cinema or two hours in the cinema I think to to expand people to make people ask questions to um, offer them realities that maybe they haven't seen about seen before or thought about before so I think that's my I think that's my job so as film and theater and, and entertainment <laughs> and performance in general is that uh, how do you assess that as a platform for communication or social change or is it and what is the actor's responsibility? Look, I think, I think in this particular time, um, it'll be really interesting to see that the films that emerge uh, out of what is going on globally at the moment. Um, and I think that, that really it's, it's made people in the West more aware about the Middle East and the amount of films that are coming out, uh, or not coming out, they've been made for years, but, but that we're seeing in the West is really important that we're, we're learning about or being exposed to other cultures, other ways of thinking. Um, and I'm a great lover of documentaries and I will often watch documentaries for, you know, preparing for a role because I think that they're, they're very educative as a, as, a, as a form. But, I mean, the arts is all about communication. Painting is all about communication. But it's not about telling people what to think and there's a big difference. So there. <laughs> <laughs> Casey Scott? Move over here. Hi. Uh, describe your preparation <clears throat> for, for a role, like The Gift, which was superb. Oh, thank you. I had a good time making that film. Um, I, I've never been to a psychic. I'm not particularly interested in being told what's going to happen in the future. I like surprises. So I did visit a lot of psychics and made the, the mistake of going to quite a few in L.A. And so I realised after a while that they just read the trades. <laughs> you know? So um, I, yeah, I, I, um, I hung out in Savannah for a while and I, I suppose for that film, I <laughs> had been, been brought up by, uh, by my, my father died when I was quite young, by a mother alone, I sort of knew the the plights of that quite intimately. But um, it was mostly about knowing what the world is and the prejudice against, you know, like if you, if you go to a dinner party, it's, it's sort of like saying you work for the CIA, saying you're a psychic, you know. It's like, <laughs> what, what do people say to that? So it's, it's trying to understand the difficulties that they face. Um, and also, I think a lot of things were cut out of the film. Uh, well, I know they were cut out of the film, um, but there was there was a strong sense of unresolved or undealt with grief, 
which I don't think came across in the final film, but that was something that I, I thought about quite a lot. Um, but it was mostly spending time there and thinking about her socioeconomic situation. I think. At this point in your career, um, where do you see yourself going from here, or do you? And uh, at this point, have you had any regrets? Regrets? Um, that I'm not pregnant at the moment. <laughs> breed, breed, breed. Is that <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I'm not a great believer in, re in regrets. I think that's sort of, you've got to move on. Mm. You make the decisions you make and for right or for wrong and you have to take responsibility for them. Uh, I don't know. I'm really excited by the fact I have no idea. And also, I, I think that my natural inclination certainly as a teenager, was to direct rather than to act. I wanted to watch rather than be watched. So um, I don't know how much longer I'll be doing it. Um, I might be joining a different union in a couple of years. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so... But, but maybe that's just a way of me thinking about work. Maybe I just think, well, I would love to direct, but that helps me as an actor. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, I have no idea. Hopefully seven children and... <laughs> Seven well-educated children. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts for, or advice for our actors here? Oh, can you prompt me on that one? Is it <laughs> well, what uh, words of wisdom can you that we haven't covered yet? Is there anything that you'd like to talk about that? I that think it's really important. I, and then look, I think any advice you give to an actor is any advice you give to any human being, and I think it's really vital. Um, to have a healthy sense of self-respect and to have boundaries and to have, but then to be boundaryless so that you have a, a clear sense of what your values are, of why you're doing it, of what, what you want to impart to people, what you think you can offer really. And I think that even though you might, I think personally having that self-respect, that means you've got certain limitations. When you get on set, you, you want to have no limitations whatsoever. I think that you know, it's sort of like seeing the horizon. You know, it's, it, it, there, there are things beyond that. You don't want to cut yourself off. So, um, but yeah, I think it's self-respect, really. And respect for other people, respect for your audience. And that really pisses me off <laughs> with a lot of films I see. I just feel really patronised by them. Um, and I think that the audience is intelligent. Um, and so I think that, yeah, respect for yourself and respect for your audience would be the only thing I'd say. I think. Ms. Blanchard, thank you so much for Pleasure. spending time with us. Thank you.